Good afternoon, everybody. I'm here today to talk to you about all you need to know about adding a large language model to your existing application. I'll be talking mostly about OpenAI, but all the things that apply to OpenAI are also applying to any other large language model like Claude or Gemini or whatever you want to use. Or even if you have your host your own language model like, model like Llama and you have an API for that, you can obviously also use that. As you might have heard, LLMs are all the rage right now. Everybody's talking about AI, everybody's talking about LLMs. Uh, take, for example, Loom, a software for screen recording, uh, which now adds the video titles, descriptions, and the chapters automatically, so you don't have to do that after uploading. Or if you are a Duolingo user, you might have used their AI conversation, where you can speak with an actual AI in the language of your choice and practice your speaking skills. At Vercara, where we help companies upskill their employees, we have added AI capabilities to multiple parts of our app over the past year and a half. Users can now learn with a tutor and take assessments which feel like conversation instead of tests. So before we had tests you might all know out of university where you do multiple choice. Now you can talk like you would talk with an instructor and this um, AI that's in the background help, uh, evaluates you and uh, gives you the results afterwards. My name is Sebastian, and at Vercara, I, I have many unofficial titles, and I'm also a prompt whisperer there, because I was among the first people who used an LLM to integrate it into our application. So how do you add an LLM to your application? It's fairly easy. It's just one HTTP request away. All you need is an open API key in terms of open, a open AI. And um, you need to know the, the JSON you need to send in. in and it's fairly easy API. You send in as a minimum the model and the messages you want to send. And what you get back is a JSON, which also contains the output, which is the output from the LLM. Or if you're in Elixir land and you have an Elixir application, you can use one of the many libraries which wrap this HTTP request, and then you have a nice Elixir syntax. But it's not very different from the, from the HTTP request. So adding an LLM is just like any other API, and I'm done for today. <laughs> not so fast. It's actually not just like any other API. It's a little bit more complicated. And that's because the prompt that you send in is not a defined API. So while the JSON structure is very defined and very easy, the prompt, which actually triggers the LLM to do something and gives you something in return, is not very well defined. You might also be want to stream the output you get from the LLM directly to your user, and that causes also some problems. You might want to test your application, and then you run into various problems. And in addition to version changes in the API, which are not that frequent, actually, you have model version changes, which change a lot. So imagine that your boss comes to you and says, hey, we want to add an LM. I have heard good things about it. What about this and that feature? You first need to figure out what you actually need to input into the LLM to get back what you expect. So let's think about um, some example of an app where you, I don't know, do a multiple choice quiz, and um, you need to figure out what to actually send in. So you can use ChatGPT or Claude to start, and most of you might have seen this. This is the, the normal ChatGPT, nothing, nothing fancy, and there you can just try different prompts and see what comes back and do a first testing. Is this even feasible? Maybe you don't get back the results you expected. Maybe the quality is not good. And then you need to iterate. And if you don't find a path where it's actually working, then this might not be a good idea, it might not be a good use case for an LLM. And if you think back to the first example I gave, I did in the messages, I sent in a system message and a user message. And that's something that you cannot do with ChatGPT. For that, 
you need the GPT Playground to go deeper. Here, you can have a system prompt, you can have assistant messages and user messages, and you can define various parameters. The system prompt is, ex is especially important because here you can define the guardrails of the system and then the user has a hard time overriding them. So when, you, when we've seen in the, in the news, sometimes there is an example of an app which should actually give you, I don't know, helpful um, ideas about um, whatever the, the application should uh, trigger back, but users are able to get outside of this constrained context and do something totally different with the app. And if you write a system prompt in a, uh, in a good manner and be able to guardrail it, then this is way harder. So with this GPT Playground, you are much nearer to the API. You can define everything in here, which you can also do in the API. And this is for going deeper and actually trying out more defined water would I actually send in my, in my application. And when you have done that and you have a great, great prompt and everything is working, then you can use a tool like PromptFoo to iterate on this prompt, do some um, tests with it. PromptFoo is a tool that is written in JavaScript, so it's not in Elixir, sadly, but it doesn't matter, you don't need a lot of JavaScript to use it. And in PromptFoo, you can um, define your prompts, define the inputs, and then run tests like you would uh, some unit tests. And you can also do uh, um, much more integrated things like red teaming, where you try to break it, and stuff like that. So how would this look like? You define a prompt in a YAML file. Everything is YAML with uh, PromptFoo. And again, we are having the same prompt as before, only now I have a parameter for the content because that's what I want to then change depending on the user input. So I'm defining a variable here. I have a very short config file where I define the model and the prompts again. And then I can write tests. So in my first test here, my user prompt is give me exactly one random word. And then I use a JavaScript assert to, in this case, test if I get actually one word back. And then I run it. And I get back the success. So I know everything is working. It's actually one word. There is a lot of info up there, which is quite hard to read in the, in the CLI. So that's why there is a prompt for few command, which opens a browser and then shows you these nice results. So in this case, we see we have the description of the test, we have what I inputted as the user prompt, and what I get back as the word, and that the tests actually pass. And if you know, imagine you have a bigger application, you have different prompts, different inputs, you can pass in different parameters to this test where you test it five times and evaluate it every time. If you have structured output, you can define various tests for the structured output. And then if something changes, you will be alerted because your tests will start failing. Obviously, one thing that this tool cannot do is it cannot do quality assurance. So I don't know if this is actually one English word or if this is a word in another language or if it's just gibberish. All I know is, okay, it's, it's one word because that's what I'm actually testing. And if you think about your application, you might be able to, if you say, I want to have two paragraphs, you might be able to test if these are two paragraphs, but you might not be able to, or you are not able to actually make sense of them. There are some tricks in there, so you can define prompt foo to then give the result you got back to another LLM to ask it if this is actually if this makes sense. So you have a second step. But again, in some weird combination, it might be that both of them fail, and then you have a passing test, even though it's actually failing. So that's the one thing which prompt foo cannot do for you. Now you're adding this, this feature to your, API, to your app and you want to stream structured data back to the client instead of waiting for the full result. So if you do a chat completion with OpenAI, you wait for the full result to come back to you. But this means also that the user has to wait five seconds or however long the time is for OpenAI to generate the response. So you might decide, hey, I would actually 
like to stream data back. So imagine an example, and I mentioned this before, of a multiple choice quiz, where you, we want a question, we want multiple answers, and the information which answers are correct. Now, if you put all of this in one prompt and just say, give me everything back, then we have no way of knowing in our application what is the question and what are the answers and what is the correct one, because it will just give us back, maybe it will write a text which this is the actual, an uh, this is the question and this is the answer, but uh, we won't be able to distinguish this in our application automatically. To solve this, we could ask for each field separately. So we could ask, hey, respond with only the question about this topic, and then we stream that back to the client, and when it's done, we ask for the first answer. So we are putting back the question because chat completion is stateless, so it doesn't know that we talked before and doesn't know that it gave us a question, so we need to feed the question back in. And then we ask for the uh, question, yeah. And then uh, we ask for the first answer to this question, and we get it back, we ask for the second one, and so on. One big drawback is that, as you can see, the prompt gets very long, and you pay for every token, so this gets exponentially more expensive as you go along. And it's also wasteful because you, are, you already know what you want to know, but you are iterating over and over again. So it's not the best solution, but it's one very easy solution of actually streaming the data and knowing exactly what you get back right now. Because if you're in this step, you actually know, okay, I now got the first question. You could also, also ask it for a specific streamable format, which is what we did in the beginning at Vercara. So we asked for a CSV where it makes sense or for some custom separators. So for example, I could say, hey, generate me the question and the answers and separate them with three minuses. And I did not test this and I doubt this will work in this case because it's too short, I just made it so it fits on a fits on the screen, uh, but if you get a little bit more specific, it usually works and it's correct 99% of the time. You just need to iterate on the prompt a bit. And then in your process that receives the stream, you, you then need to implement waiting for the three minuses. Then you know, okay, now the question is done. Now I'm in the first answer. And from this process, or if you want to handle it directly in the live view, you can handle it directly in the live view, display it to the user and handle it that way. The third option is use structured output, which means JSON, which is new, or it's not new anymore, but it was new at one point in the uh, OpenAI API. And here you define the schema you want to get back, and OpenAI makes sure that you always get this schema back. And then you can use a library like Jackson to parse it on the fly, where you need to implement the Jackson parser and the Jackson parser will tell you if you are just right now getting a, getting a key or you're getting a value and what the key is. So then you need to implement your own logic about handling all of this, but it's possible. Or if you want to go the middle ground, you can use a library like Instructor EX, which lets you partially stream JSON. So what this means is that instead of you getting back every token, Instructor X will wait for one of the fields to be filled, so one of the key value pairs to be filled, then it gives you back the full JSON, but all the other fields will be nil. So in our example, we would get a JSON which has the question key and then the value for the question, but everything else will be nil. And as soon as it gets the answer one, then it will also give us back a new JSON with the question and the answer one, and then the two and three and four and so on. So this way, the user doesn't have to wait for the full prompt to be returned, for the full output to be back, but it the user would also not see the tokens like building up nicely and like every every few milliseconds, whatever, but it would wait for, okay, now here's the question, wait a bit, here's the first answer, here's the second answer. So it depends a little bit on your use case. What do you want to do? When it comes to testing, you will need some kind of test double, some kind of mock, something. Because the LM will give you back different responses depending on whatever. So if you're matching on strings, for example, when it returns, or you're, uh, you're testing your, your application with a multiple choice question and you expect the question to be there, it will, be, it will not work. So create a test double, create it early. 
because in addition to flaky tests, you will also incur costs if you use an actual OpenAI API. And also use this test double for, te for dev environments because you will work a lot on, for example, making the UI nice for the streaming back of the data. And if every time this is an open AI call and you incur all the costs, it will, it will get it will get costly, as we experienced at Vercara, where back in the days when, when we were beginning, there was a limit of $100 per day, and we were hitting this on all the work days, because there the developers were working, and they were testing, and they were reloading, and reloading, and reloading, and every time we would get back a new response from OpenAI, but we were actually not caring about the OpenAI response, we were only caring about that something is streamed back, and we can actually make it nice in the UI, for example. When it comes to version changes in LLMs, model version changes, I have to be precise here, then there is no real way of working with that, or there's no real best practices, because every version does something different. You need to test it. If you're using prompt food, it's very easy. You can just add two providers. You can actually then repeat it five times, and you get 10 results back, five from the old, five from the new, and then you can do some quality assurance here and see if the results still match what you expect. One tip I have picked up is store the model with the data generated, because then you can get back and do some quality assurance after the fact and see, okay, here I use this model and here I use this model, especially if you do feature flagging and maybe one customer sees the old model, one customer sees the new model or whatever. For the sake of time, I couldn't go into this rabbit holes which are also important, but um, 20 minutes is not enough to talk about all of this. So quality control, as I've said, is it's a, a very big topic. With PromptFu, you can get a little bit of that because you can share the results, you can, you can test it again and again, but still knowing that you got the right thing back is very hard because it's so, it can depend on so many factors. I also didn't talk about error handling. There are a few errors that uh, in these APIs happen, which you might look out for. I didn't talk about function calling and assistance, which are two features of OpenAI and some other models, uh, some other APIs, but not all of them. So if you want to talk about this, come to me later, and we can discuss everything. So yeah, LLMs and adding LLMs to an application is almost like any other API. And I hope with these tips, it's a smooth sailing for you. Thank you very much. <laughs>